I have made several videos this year about why you should consider avoiding shampoo as well as ordinary skin soap and sunscreen. The feedback has been remarkable, with a huge number of viewers around the world reporting they couldn't believe how easy it was to stop the use of these products. Over the years I have also received requests to make a video about deodorant. There is a lot of mythology surrounding sweating and body odour in the alleged science. As one may suspect, the pharmaceutical industry and their marketing teams have been setting the narratives and convincing most of the population to use their wares. In this video we explore how these products work, the problems they may be hiding, and how to reduce your exposure if you are a regular user. Get a little closer. closer. Now don't be shy. Closer. You can get, you can get a little closer, closer with Arid Extra Dry. Only Arid has a patent on this formula that fights wetness. No leading deodorant spray stops odor better. And now Arid has a new baby fresh scent. It smells mmm. Get a little closer, closer with the baby fresh scent of Arid Extra Dry. Arid fights wetness and odor. Now in a new baby fresh scent. Throughout history, people have used fragrances to purportedly make themselves smell better. Ancient Egyptians worked out how to capture aromatic compounds in balms and oils, which could be applied to the body. In India, around 2500 BC, perfumes were developed with natural compounds such as saffron, jasmine and sandalwood. By the 1300s, distillation was being employed to extract more powerful scents. The late 1800s saw the rise of laboratory chemistry and the first fully synthetic compounds, marking the start of the fragrance industry as we know it today. It was also around this time that Mum, the first brand of commercial deodorant, hit the market. According to the Mum website, an unknown inventor from Philadelphia, USA, developed a waxy cream with a low content of antibacterial zinc oxide in 1888. The first mum deodorant was born. There are several mechanisms for how deodorants are supposed to work, and the antibacterial action mentioned here brings us to one of them. Human sweat is generally odourless, as most of it comes from body skin that secretes an electrolyte solution that is water and some salts. However, in some parts of the body, such as the armpits, the glands can secrete other compounds, such as proteins and fatty acids. It is thought that the bacteria present in the armpits then start to metabolize these substances and create what is known as body odor, which is often unpleasant. When it comes to health matters, Wikipedia is notorious for putting people on the wrong scent. The entry body odor states that, in humans, the formation of body odours is caused by factors such as diet, sex, health and medication. But the major contribution comes from bacterial activity on skin gland secretions and provides a single citation. However, this links to a paper published in 2010 with the title Functional Neuronal Processing of Human Body Odours and the authors do not actually make this claim about bacteria. Once again, the Wikipedia deception is likely to be an offshoot of germ theory thinking. In this case, blaming the problem on microbes who just happened to be in the area at the time. Blaming it on ubiquitous microbes also goes against what we witness in everyday life. Like many athletes, my husband Mark can sweat for hours on end doing endurance sport without a hint of bad smells. Conversely, I've seen very unhealthy patients who can stink out a consultation room with just a few beads of sweat. We are all covered by the same varieties of microbes, so it is not the bugs themselves, but the underlying body or terrain that is important when it comes to bad smells. This constitutes not only what is being secreted in the sweat, but also the condition of the skin itself. This is very important because as already mentioned, one mechanism of deodorants is through antibacterial action. While it may be effective against some odours, it essentially covers up one of nature's warnings that the underlying terrain has a problem. 
Another action of deodorants is through antiperspirant compounds that slow down sweating, basically by blocking the sweat from getting to the surface of the skin. The first antiperspirant was called Everdry and hit the market in 1903. Another product known as Oda Oh No was launched in the 1910s. Its active ingredient was aluminium chloride and it was so, quote, effective that it stopped underarm sweating for up to three days after one application. However, it could also be highly irritating and sometimes damaged clothing. The aluminium-based deodorants work by literally blocking the sweat glands by forming occlusive plugs in the ducts. Even the FDA has acknowledged it needs to monitor the levels of aluminium in these products, but in general has stated that they are safe up to levels of 6.25% in direct application antiperspirants. While we should of course not be reassured by these safety claims, I would point out that a far bigger concern is aluminium that is injected into the body. This almost always comes from vaccines, and you can watch my video, Aluminium, Vaccines and Detox, to find out more about this problem. Another additive in deodorants is fragrance, which essentially acts like perfume. Fragrance compounds probably have little effect on the physiology and microbiome of the armpit, and simply work by covering up and distracting from body smells. Also in the pipeline are so-called polymer nanoparticle preparations, they are supposed to work by binding the secreted precursor molecules so the bacteria can't convert them into stinky ones. Despite the traditional deodorants being promoted as safe for decades, it was interesting to read this article state that typical deodorants tackle the stink by going after the bacteria with a bactericide such as triclosan or chlorhexidine. But researchers worry using those may disrupt the balance of healthful bacteria on the skin or lead to the evolution of resistant bacteria. Antiperspirants, on the other hand, contain aluminium salts to staunch the flow of sweat from the pores. But that can lead to skin irritation, and some people want to avoid products that block pores with these ingredients. Cue the permitted release valve narrative in the form of polymer nanoparticles to keep everyone on the deodorant plantation. This smacks of gaslighting, or at least marketing aimed at those already suspicious of these products. Coming back to the 2010 paper about human body odour, there is some interesting information, and they state that one long-standing view propagated in scientific and popular scientific literature, and accepted by scientists and laymen alike, is that the olfactory system plays a subordinate or unimportant role in human social lives. In reality, the US market alone spent more than $25 billion in 2001 on scented products in an effort to eliminate, hide or enhance natural human body odours. This directly contradicts the general view that the olfactory sense is in any way residual or subordinate to other human sensory systems. It was refreshing to see them call this out, because one of the references we reviewed was the Handbook of Cosmetic Science and Technology, 3rd edition, published in 2009. In the antiperspirants chapter, it states that apocrine glands are apparently a relic from the phylogenetic development of man. Decomposition of apocrine sweat by skin bacteria is responsible for the characteristic malodor of human sweat. In medical school, we were also taught that the appendix is some sort of relic, and we have, quote, evolved to make it redundant. Not bloody likely. <laughs> This kind of misguided thinking permeates allopathic medical models. It has invented a system where the body has all sorts of bits that turn against us. No wonder that during medical training, many of the students develop health anxiety, thinking about the thousands of diseases that might come for them one day. It would be most unwise to consider glands as redundant. They all serve a vital function, whether it be metabolism, elimination, or nature's signalling to ourselves or others. You will also see the claim that typical sweat contains mostly water, so reducing or stopping this doesn't matter. For example, the statement that it contains 98% to 99% water and 1% to 2% inorganic and organic compounds. Inorganic components include sodium chloride and traces of potassium, calcium, magnesium, iron, and copper ions. Organic components include lactic acid, citric acid, formic acid, propionic acid, butyric acid, urea, and ammonia. This framing can be misleading for a number of reasons. 
Firstly, even if it is mostly water, there is a whole lot of other stuff, regardless if the amounts of them are small. The body has elected to get rid of the sweat and eliminatory processes should be encouraged, not suppressed. The mainstream view also tends to negate the fact that the skin is an eliminatory organ and toxins can be passed out of the body through the sweat. Because the so-called immune system is crucial for maintaining the allopathic model, the mainstream usually describes skin reactions in this sense and prescribe pharmaceuticals to suppress the responses. This is a huge mistake as it only covers up nature's healing attempts rather than address the underlying toxicity and help the body through its healing crisis. As my regular viewers will know, we always go upstream to look at why something is manifesting in the first place. On that principle, interfering with sweat production, launching attacks on bystander microbes or trying to overpower unwanted smells are all the wrong approach. If your body smells bad, then it is time for a clean up. This involves looking at factors such as water, diet, exercise, pharmaceutical toxicity and psychological factors. Another question that comes up is whether underarm shaving has any effect on body odour. There have been a couple of scientific publications, including a small study in 2011, where they concluded that our results show that axillary odour of shaved armpits is rated as more pleasant, more attractive and less intense compared to the unshaved armpits of the same individual. However, the magnitude of the effect was fairly small, so the odour issue is not much of a consideration in the decision to shave the armpits. In case you were wondering, I have always kept my armpits smooth and have not had any health issues doing so. The axilla is often overlooked when it comes to skin care, with many people simply squirting deodorant under the arm without further thought to skin and gland health. You can watch my video, Better Skin With No Soap, for some tips on a care routine. Like many pharmaceutical creations, deodorants and antiperspirants were made mainstream by convincing people that they had a definitive solution to a problem. Right from the start, the advertising has targeted the theme of being attractive to potential mates, and there is no doubt that this has been effective. An advert in the 1930s stated that, You're a pretty girl, Mary, and you're smart about most things, but you're just a bit stupid about yourself. In this smart modern age, it's against the code for a girl, or a man either, to carry the repellent odour of underarm perspiration on clothing and person. It's a fault which never fails to carry its own punishment. Unpopularity. Apparently, if you don't put on the products, you are taking a big social risk. Not only that, but they have been frequently portrayed as aphrodisiacs with incredible powers to initiate intimate encounters. Insignia, the new all over body program. New Denver deodorant. Take control. But this is all fantasy stuff targeting teenagers and the Lonely Hearts Club. When it comes to being healthy or attracting and sustaining a successful relationship, you've got to address your entire physical, psychological and spiritual being. There are no shortcuts or cover-ups, and we detail all of these aspects in our videos and articles, as well as the book Terrain Therapy. So don't fall for marketing campaigns and narratives set by the pharmaceutical and chemical industries. They have products to peddle, and increasing their sales is not being done with your true health in mind. Those who are environmentally conscious would also not be impressed by the amount of packaging and runoff chemicals that are ending up in landfills. Some product lines have addressed this with biodegradable packaging and less toxic ingredients. Whether so-called natural deodorants are better depends on what they contain, but some are preferable alternatives. However, take comfort that we have been created in a perfect image, and if we respect the laws of nature, there is very little, if any, benefit in applying deodorants and antiperspirants. Perhaps there is only occasions such as long-haul flights when you're about to be picked up at the airport by new acquaintances and don't smell so good. 
On the other hand, in that setting, what you really need is a shower and recovery time. Unlike some products, you can stop deodorants right away, typically without any rebound or withdrawal, so it's easy to give it a try. Right thinking and right living is done without these chemicals and shifting the focus to the things that bring you true health. If you enjoyed this video, please visit support.dsam.com 